So that on, on the second day. So I hope you enjoy the first one based on the smiles yesterday. <laughs> Quite, uh, positive, and uh, I think we had some good discussions and good connections. So, um, so the, the, the purpose of the conference is hopefully each other and then start doing something together. So, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Marta Bosbridge, and uh, I invited her because I'm hearing about her all the time. In, in so if there is some kind of topic of identification. Then she's asked by the journalists and then all of this on if he reads Hungarian reports, then she's on, on gamification. So, and then also we, we met her in Budapest with uh, Diego and Cecilia, and we talked about very interesting things. And she has a very large group of women, 3,000 teachers in Hungary who, who are doing gamification, and then she's in, uh, encouraging the teachers. So, we are very curious what you want to say. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's great to be here. We had a wonderful day yesterday. I really enjoyed it. Although I had to cross out half of my presentation, but, <laughs> but that's okay uh, because I have a lot to say. So I will focus more on the Hungarian context and on the things that I do and less on gamification in general because you had uh, quite a lot of things about that yesterday which is uh, also very good that I can refer to a lot of presentations uh, and a lot of things that you have said, um, and I hope you will enjoy it. So, um, one of the first things that I was uh, smiling at uh, uh, Sela yesterday, that I started exactly the same. Who am I? <laughs> Question mark and listing the things. So, um, I'm a teacher of mathematics and English, and mathematics in English, so that's the sledge there. I uh, teach at uh, Patrick Lajos Vocational School. Uh, this is a bilingual school where I teach maths in English. Uh, this is a public secondary school. Um, we have the secondary school from ages 14 to 18. However, because they, it's a bilingual one, they have an extra year of uh, language learning uh, before they start. So some of my students are 19 or 20 years old when uh, they finish the secondary school. Um, I'm also uh, teaching uh, future teachers uh, in teacher training at Utvish Lorand University and at uh, Budapest Semesters in Mathematics Education. This is a program for American uh, future uh, math teachers who come to Hungary for a semester. And I am also a student, a PhD student at Utvish Lorand University in the education uh, program at the language pedagogy, which is very interesting because I'm teaching maths and you might wonder how does it go to language pedagogy, but I'm doing it uh, in English and uh, that's, how, that's why you can call it uh, language pedagogy. And uh, my field is alternative assessment which is uh, very much can be used anywhere, so it's not only attached to, to one subject. Um, and I like to call myself a researcher, uh, partly because of my PhD research, but I'm uh, also proud to be part of the content pedagogy uh, research program of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, we have uh, an experiment to try out discovery learning, uh, namely the POSHA method uh, in schools, which was designed to train very uh, talented ALIT students. And what we are looking at, whether it can be used in an average uh, secondary school class. So that's all the things I am. So I have lots of hats here, and sometimes I will talk from the researcher's point of view, sometimes from the student, and sometimes from the teacher. Uh, this is going to be the quickest slide because you have heard a lot about uh, gamification, so I'm not going to talk uh, much about it. But uh, it's very important uh, to know that although it's a big hype now, uh, there is not much new things in it as we um, have talked about it. So there are a lot of uh, game design elements in non-game contexts earlier. And there are lots of other things uh, that uh, uh, can be categorized like entertainment, serious game, playful design that are existed before gamification. Uh, and this uh, Dr. Zach Fitzwalter 
uh, created a very nice infographics. Um, this is part of that, so you can uh, check it out. It's, it's a very good summary of how gamification developed and what happened. Uh, what is interesting that in 2011, it was put on uh, Gartner's hype curve because it became uh, a great hype. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, it was in 2011 and soon it arrived to the peak of inflated expectations and after that it went through the draft of disillusionment and <laughs> came down very quickly. I've heard some of my colleagues uh, who were in the US that uh, it's sometimes uh, a curse. It's like, oh, gamification, no, 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 thank you. That, we don't want any of that. Uh, I don't know if all the countries should go through this cycle or not. Uh, in Hungary, I'm, uh, I don't know, but what I see is that we are still in the, at the peak of expectations. Um, for example, I'm organizing a conference next week and uh, we offer five workshops to the teachers uh, from which they can choose three. One of them is gamification. 85% uh, of the teachers chose that. And 99% uh, chose gamification and or alternative assessment, uh, which is partly based on gamification. So there is a very, very uh, great interest in um, gamification in Hungary. and. Uh, the reason why I think that it went down and now it's going slowly up to the slope of enlightenment or maybe we have reached a plateau of productivity uh, in some cases more or in some cases with less success um, is I think that if you hear about the game elements uh, and what it got in the US, this points, badges, leaderboards uh, approach and what has been said yesterday that uh, it's very much the behaviorist sticks and carrots and rewards and punishment thing. And uh, there has been a lot of research showing how you can kill intrinsic motivation with extrinsic rewards. And um, if you just do that, then the whole thing won't work. <laughs> and uh, one of my uh, favorite examples is from a colleague, uh, Tibor Priyavara, who is an English teacher. And uh, his students, Hungarian students uh, studying English, started to write poems in English. And he was so happy. And he gave them fives. That's the best grade in the Hungarian system. They immediately stopped doing that. OK, so don't kill the intrinsic motivation with extrinsic rewards. And I think this is one of the, the very important thing to, to learn and to know uh, about gamification. In the Hungarian school context, unfortunately, I'm not worried about that because there are not much intrinsic motivation there. So it's, it's rather, rather trying to bring in some intrinsic motivation, which is the goal. Um, but still, we have to pay attention to that, whatever we do. So after this very short history of gamification, a little bit of history of mine. Um, so well, how, how did I come to do this? And, and why am I the person <laughs> whom everybody finds when they uh, look at uh, gamification in Hungary? Well, uh, it started all in conferences. I was very inspired. Uh, by some of the speakers in 2013, Tibor Priyavara. If you Google the 21st century teacher tells from a pedagogical experiment, he has a blog entry uh, in English. Otherwise, he wrote a book in Hungarian about it. And it was in 2013, so very much uh, in the beginning, he already found uh, gamification and talked about it at conferences. Uh, and then, because I had to choose my uh, master's degree thesis topic at that time, I immediately knew that, okay, I'm gonna do that. So I chose that uh, as my topic to have assessment based on gamification. And uh, I did some teacher interviews back then who have already heard about it. Well, that was about four or five teachers. <laughs> Uh, but I interviewed them and I thought that I launch a Facebook group so they can, because they were in different schools, so they can um, meet each other, communicate with each other. So since then, this is what Rod mentioned, I have almost 3,000 teachers in this group who are all interested in gamification and we are organizing workshops and events and share information with each other. 
And uh, the other thing that I started doing is that uh, I uh, had questionnaires for my students. Uh, and uh, it was not um, an official research, but because I was interested in my students' opinion, I kept asking them about different things. So these 133 students uh, were all my students whom I was asking about how this whole assessment thing goes, what do they think about it, and, and how can we make things better. And now uh, I'm doing my PhD, and I've just realized when I was putting together this presentation that basically what I'm doing quite the same thing. I'm interviewing teachers. I have piloted uh, an interview guy and guide and have uh, um, the results of the four interviews with innovative teachers who are already uh, using assessment based on gamification. Um, I'm planning an action research project. And then I would like my students' uh, opinion to see how it works. Uh, the main difference is the level of research methodology that I have um, learned since then. Um, what was missing from yesterday, and we, <laughs> I was asked to talk about it, the 21st century skills, um, there are lots of lots of categorization. Uh, this one is from a Microsoft research uh, that they collected. And uh, I wrote 21st century skills versus Hungary here uh, because I would like to show how um, difficult the situation is. And uh, yesterday when uh, we heard about Fabian's uh, presentation, we could, we could very relate to the situation in Uruguay because we have a very similar educational context. So cooperation and within that skilled communication would, would be one of the main uh, components. And in Hungarian schools, it's not really present. <laughs> so uh, what happens is that students sit uh, in front of the t uh, teacher, the teacher talks, writes on the blackboard, and uh, students are usually punished if they cooperate or that uh, counts as cheating. Um, of course, not all the time and not with every teacher, but the majority is like that. And um, the other important skill would be knowledge construction. And uh, again, it's quite impossible if it's the teacher who tells you that this is the quadratic formula. It's used to solve this equation. Here is an example. Now practice it and then we have a test. So that's not knowledge construction. Knowledge construction means that they construct it for themselves. And this is a very big part of the research with the experimental class that we do, is that they discover the things for themselves. So I give them questions, um, tasks to do, and meanwhile they're working on it. They realize that, oh, okay, there is some rule here that we can find, or let's create one for ourselves. And then it's their knowledge that they constructed, nobody can take it away from them. Um, Self-regulation, um, if it's the teacher who tells you what to do and you have to behave and you have no say in it and no opinion and no choice, then it's very difficult <laughs> to cater for self-regulation. It's the teacher who regulates everything. Um, problem solving, again, sometimes put there that real life problem solving. So being able to, to uh, reflect on ideas and not just wait for someone else to tell what to do, how to solve it. Uh, and here comes innovation and creativity. Very important. Um, the last one is the in information communication technologies, uh, the skilled use of them which means that, for example, for learning, so not just uh, social connections, but really use it for learning. Um, so that's not really the situation in Hungary. And what I am looking at is that, how can we hack the system from inside? What can we do that we do develop these skills and uh, help students uh, in them, to develop in them. And a lot of teachers ask me, but okay, what can I do? I mean, it's risky, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, I don't have this, I don't have that. And I always tell them to smart, start in small. So you don't have to gamify the whole course, you don't have to change everything, and uh, 
what I say is that you can do just micro gamification. Okay, just include one or two game elements in a simple thing. It doesn't have to be uh, online, it doesn't have to include an app. Um, if you are practicing uh, square root operations, you know, you can, you can make a game out of it, just put it on a domino, put students in groups, have, make them cooperate, um, play a game with it. And uh, it's much more different than just sitting down and writing the, the calculations one after the other. Uh, I was uh, in England for a course and Professor Don Newton uh, wrote me a lot of great examples. This is one of them. Um, these little uh, green cards uh, contain, um, I don't know why square root again, but anyway, so square root expressions. Um, and uh, every student gets a piece. They have to find the group based on who has the same value on them. So by creating groups, they are already practicing that uh, um, skill or, or, or the material that we are learning. And then when they have groups, in this case, groups of four or five, then each student has one uh, expression to solve. And at the, in the middle, they have to write the sum of what they have calculated, and they tell me only the sum. So what's good in it is that uh, they can work together, because if somebody doesn't know something, then uh, the team members can help each other. Um, if we would like, we can have a little competition between the groups. And a totally boring uh, calculation or exercise or practice can become very interesting. And what happens is that if uh, the sum is wrong, I'm not telling them where the mistake is, they have to find it. So I don't know if you have that, but uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of students in Hungary hate is when they have to check your answer. And why on earth do I check my answer? You know, if it's correct, it's correct. So in this case, if they know that the sum is wrong, they must check their own answers and each other's and do the whole thing. So a lot of learning, a lot of communication, a lot of cooperation happens with a very, very simple um, task. Uh, here is another game, also from Dump Newton, uh, with polygons. I don't know if you have these basketball cards or these cards that you have the person on it and then the uh, different properties or characteristics, or I think it, it was with cars as well. So why not polygons? They have a lot of characteristics that we can talk about and see who beats which one and how can uh, they play with it. They can create the ca cards for themselves and discuss the different uh, things. Again, communication, cooperation. Um, or another favorite of mine, uh, it's, uh, one of my students did it, is to create a board game. It can be to summarize a topic, or it can be this, the assessment itself. So I have a, a teacher colleague, uh, Monica Toth, who made the final assessment a board game. I mean, the students made it. And the test was that they played through the game. They had the cards, they had the questions. And by playing through the board game, basically, uh, they revised or even that you can test uh, the whole material. And as you can see, none of them contains any applications, any online thing. They're all on paper. They're all very small things that you can do um, just by changing something a little bit in order to have it more engaging, more motivating, more fun for the students. And there are lots of other game elements that you can include. One of them that my students really like is getting different titles. And... Uh, this is done by a student of mine. He looks at grade 9, 10, 11, and 12, so all the four uh, grades in high school, each and every topic that we have, and created different titles attached to the grade that you get. So as I told you, in Hungary, we have uh, grades 1 to 5. 1 is the worst, 5 is the best. And when they get a grade, they just get a title next to it. Um, I don't know how much uh, you can read it. One of them, for example, a five um, is a radical remover or um, a failing grade in trigonometry is a silly sign. So 
he was extremely creative. I would have never thought about these um, ideas, but students love it. And um, a few years ago, I had um, final uh, graders, so who were leaving um, high school the last year. And in the beginning, we talked about how serious this year is going to be for them all this high school leaving exam, tour exam, and then one of the guys raised his hand and said, Mitz, can we have titles this year as well? And I was like, yeah, sure, but okay, can I be an admiral? And I was like, oh, great, why not? And I was a 20-year-old guy. So you, you never know what, what are the things that can be motivating um, for a student. And because he wanted to become an admiral, he... Uh, collected more points than the maximum, because then it was that if you reach the maximum level, then you can become an admiral. And he did it to become an admiral. Um, hashtag school was mentioned yesterday by Cecilia. It's a, <clears throat> um, a website that it's developed by Tibor Prieva and his colleagues. And uh, this is the leaderboard of it. So you can uh, add enter points and then it shows uh, where they are. Um, and as you can see here on the left, these are the Hungarian grades that uh, from one to five, and actually you have this five with a little star. Uh, it's uh, in, usually in Hungarian elementary school, but actually uh, students love it so much that they ask for it in secondary school as well. So we have the five with a little star, and I call it that's the super master level if you uh, gather more points than the maximum. And if you remember the player types from yesterday, you have the achiever, and there are lots of overachievers, like I was when I was a student, who want to collect definitely more than the maximum. So that's, that's, that's the minimum. And, um, and you have to cater for their needs as well. Uh, and of course, there are lots of apps online. Uh, this is, for example, Quizlet, in which you can uh, create learning cards that on one side there is a word, on the other side you can write if you are learning a language, the translation, or if you are learning mathematics, the definition of that thing. <coughs> so you can uh, match things and uh, you can play a lot of games with that. Uh, that's what, yeah, so it's also a gamified app that students really like. Um, and Khan Academy was also mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, it's, I use it a lot because I teach mathematics in English and it has lots of videos and exercises in maths. So what I usually do is that I collect those that are uh, in connection with what we are learning and assign them as practice or homework for those who need it, uh, which is really great because then uh, you can cater for individual needs. So, so if somebody needs to practice more, then goes there, does a lot of practice. And this is uh, what you can see here is what I see. So as a teacher, if I go to a student's name, then I can see what were the different questions, exercises that the person did, how many problems, how many correct problems, how many hints the person used. So there is a lot of statistics about the students that, as a teacher, you can use, which is great. And uh, this is the main uh, the profile of the student. As you can see, they have an avatar here, uh, which is um, a little dragon. But actually, it starts from a little drop. And as you collect points, it develops. And again, a story of my students that I've overheard walking on the corridor that one of them said to the other that, hey, what did you do that you got a, such a nice dragon? And I was like, don't tell, everybody, don't tell anybody. I am counting beetles in the early math section. So you have sections from early math, grade one, two, three, four, so from kindergarten to university, everything. And of course, the program doesn't know how old you are. So if you are a 20-year-old guy and you are counting beetles in the early math uh, section, then you also get your points for it. And it's, it seems like that for some students, it's worth uh, to get a better dragon um, avatar. So you never know what uh, motivates people. And then again, you have a lot of badges that you can collect. Um, you can get... Uh, um, collect things if you do five questions correctly, one after the other, or if you keep coming back every day. So there are lots of different categories that 
um, the, the program um, gives feedback on. But the reason why I like it, because for example, now I am giving this speech and I know that my students at home during my lesson are doing Khan Academy practices as I'm not there because I told them which topic they should do the, the uh, practice in and um, it's no problem. Uh, okay, so before I go on, I would like to ask something. Uh, if you can write down, if you have a pen or pencil around you, or just think about it, that what is the first three things that come to your mind without thinking if you hear school assessment? What is the first three things, three words? Just write it down or, or remember it or something. This is the first time that I'm asking this in an international audience. So I'm really interested in your answers. And I will not talk about this right now, but I will ask you, or you can tell me if you would like to in the coffee break, because I'm really interested in your answers. What, what is it in an international audience that, that comes to your mind if you hear school assessment? What are your first associations? As I told you, uh, I've been doing uh, questionnaires with my students. And before I started teaching every class, on the very first lesson, I asked them to fill in a questionnaire. They didn't know anything about me. They didn't know what I was going to do or what I was planning. So they, I just asked them questions about school assessment in general. And this is one of the questions I asked them, that what is the first three things that comes to your mind if you hear school assessment? Now it's a little bit biased for you because we have been talking about similar issues, but when I go to a classroom, they, we haven't talked anything about that before, so that's kind of what really their first associations are. And the most frequent is grades. Uh, just a quick check, has anybody got grades on their list now when you had thought about it? Yeah, um, the second is tests. So, <laughs> yeah, these are the two most frequent ones that, that appear. Uh, those are the numbers, so out of the 133, 84 uh, students wrote grades and 34 tests. And I categorized these and I said that about 70% of them are neutral words like grades, tests, learning, teacher, they are the, they are the common ones. But what I was surprised is 21%, so the fifth of them are very negative, like fear, stress, uh, feeling bad, it's rigid, unfair, things like that. And only 9% was uh, wrote anything positive like success or good grades. And actually it's understandable if you know Hungarian rules and regulations that it is compulsory for the teachers to give grades from one to five uh, in a certain period of time. For example, for my uh, subjects, it's one grade a month. That's the minimum. And you should grade the student's achievement, their diligence, and uh, their um, behavior. One to five. So everything is one to five grades. That's all. And um, these grades are very important because all their future enrollment possibilities are based on them. So um, it's no surprise that, that this is what they associate uh, assessment with. And the other thing, I asked a lot of things, but what I brought here is that what would you change? And uh, it was very interesting that students didn't find it uh, fair, uh, the, the traditional grade-based assessment. They wanted to have some individuality that it would cater for their individual needs, flexibility and not just grades. And they asked for, just please, have, can we have some explanations of why we're getting that grade? So things like that. Um, and then after I had my students to write this questionnaire, I introduced them with what we are going to have assessment based on gamification, which meant that because I have to comply with rules, uh, I do give them a grade a month, but within that month, whatever they do, they collect points with, whether it's a homework, a classwork, test, whatever it is, so they collect the points and only 
after the end of the topic, we convert that point, those points into a, a topic grade, so to say. So it's not, we're not counting averages, but we're collecting the points. And of course, there are a lot of other elements, uh, the titles, the extra master points that you can exchange for things, and the levels, and, and all, all other micro gamification elements, but the basis is that. And um, what was interesting that when I asked students about that, it really turned out that it answered their needs a lot. So they found it much more fair than um, assessment based on grades. Uh, they felt that it's great that they get a continuous feedback. They know where they are, they know how they progress, they see their progression, how many points they have to collect. Uh, and it's not just one day, that the, test, the day of the test that decides their grade, but uh, they have a continuous uh, development and it encourages them to learn more. One of the students wrote that earlier, <laughs> I always prepared only for the tests, but now because I, I want to collect points, I prepare lesson by lesson. Um, the other thing that it values hard work a lot, which they really appreciate, that if you are diligent, if you do the homework, if you work during the lesson, you collect the points, and finally there is something <laughs> that reflects it. Um, mathematics is usually a very stressful subject for students in Hungary, and uh, it was fantastic to see that uh, they have less stress. And they say that it's great that I have more opportunities. Um, so for example, if I'm tired or I don't have the time to do the homework, I'm not punished, I can make it up. I can uh, work more during the lesson or do the homework the, for the next. So there are lots of opportunities in which uh, they can do and it answers uh, these kind of problems they had. Um, Hmm, okay, all right, so that's what I've been doing. And uh, as I told you that uh, I'm also doing interviews with teachers. And uh, basically uh, what I would like to um, tell you about that I think it's, what I have seen from my interviews is that um, those teachers who started using assessment, uh, alternative assessment or assessment based on gamification specifically, they always had a motivation for why what was wrong, what they wanted to change. And usually it was a lot of different things. So what I always tell to teachers is that don't just use it because it's trendy, because there is a hype around it, or because this is what people are talking about. Um, but what is your problem? What would you like to change? I started working with gamification because of this one to five grading system that we have in Hungary. And even as a teacher trainee, I was looking for ideas how to you know, make assessment better because, because I didn't want to do that. Uh, that was my motivation. But there were a lot of, lot of other motivations that I found from the interviews. And um, another thing that we should ask is what is the goal? of assessment, so why are we assessing? Um, so I yesterday said this example that at the exam, uh, there was this gamified exam in which they uh, could replay or use help uh, in different ways. And when she said it, I, I, I could imagine my uh, Hungarian uh, teacher colleague saying that, oh, and an exam, like replay and help, then how, how does it show the, the, the knowledge of the students? You know, then it's, it's worthless. It's not, it's not the, to the point. So I think it's very important to ask, why are we assessing? So, because that example is an assessment for learning. Okay, so we, we would like to facilitate learning with that. The goal is that the students learn that and not that the exam is, gives a, an objective thing. And there is the other, the assessment of learning or summative assessment, those exams in which you, you know, show what you have learned. But actually, if you think about that, it doesn't have to be that frequent. So. For in, in the Hungarian education system, we have the high school leaving Motura exam, as in uh, it's also here. Um, wouldn't it, that be enough? Like, couldn't we have uh, all the other assessments facilitate learning uh, and not just uh, test the, the, the knowledge? 
or have it like, I don't know, end of the year or half a year or end of each semester or whatever. So I think that there are lots of lots of ways that uh, we can change. In Hungary now, all of the tests and all of the assessments are this summative type. There are not much assessment that would really facilitate learning. Um, the other thing that the teachers told me is that they would like to develop these 21st century skills. And, uh, and because usually the system uh, hinders this, then, then with this type of assessment it's possible. They can introduce individual learning paths. Um, I really like the idea uh, about leaderboards to have different topics or different focuses. One of my uh, colleagues uh, whom I interviewed teaches in a very, very disadvantaged school. And she uses uh, assessment based on gamification. But the first thing that she cut out was the leaderboards. She said, no way there was going to be any leaderboards in that group. That would ruin the whole thing. Because what they are doing is that the students have their individual goals. They go on in groups or individually uh, working on their level, doing their thing. And you can't compare them. There is no point of comparing them. So they collect their points for doing completely different things on different levels. But the point is that they develop compared to themselves and not to the other classmates in the group. Um, so that's also possible. And autonomy, we also talked about the different uh, motivational theories yesterday, which is very important. So how can students take responsibility for their own learning process? And uh, as I said, that students' feedback was that they found this kind of assessment fair. Um, and actually, we don't uh, argue much. When you get a grade and you don't agree with it, then you, know, you can have an argument or not with the teacher. But if all the rules are clear and set and you know what is worth what and, and how, how, the thing, how the system works, then um, there is not much to argue. Uh, some, uh, some of my colleagues asked me if my students copy the homework uh, from each other. And I, I started thinking about it and I realized that because I'm not punishing him uh, or the students or any, anybody for not doing the homework, that's why they are much more willing to admit if you know, they wouldn't be able to do it and they don't see the point of copying. Uh, of course, it, you can't uh, entirely eliminate cheating, but the goal would be that students understand that it's not for the grade that they are learning, it's not for the school, not for the teacher. And I think that this type of assessment helps a lot in developing that. Developing the competence that yes, I can do it, the motivation. Um, it gives space 